My name is Silas Allard. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture on behalf of our center. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion is a thought leader dedicated to producing innovative scholarship, facilitating challenging conversations, convening the best minds, and training the next generation of academics, lawyers, and relig religious leaders to advance the emerging global conversation on law and religion. We are proud to have led this field of study for over 30 years. Today, the center is home to the leading journal in the field, the Journal of Law and Religion, which we publish in collaboration with Cambridge University Press. We also edit three important book series in the field, two series also published with Cambridge, the Cambridge Series in Law and Christianity and the Cambridge Series in Law and Judaism as well as the Emory University Ser Studies series in Law and Religion, published by William B. Eerdmans Press. For our students, we offer six graduate degree programs, dozens of interdisciplinary courses across the campus, and skills building opportunities, such as our moot court team. We collaborate with faculty and fellows around the world to sponsor pathbreaking research projects and important co public conversations, such as the lecture we are hosting this evening. This evening's lecture is made possible by the generosity of donors who contributed to the Harold J. Berman Memorial Fund to establish this lecture series in honor of Professor Harold Berman. Professor Berman, Emory's first Robert W. Woodruff Professor of Law, was a great polymath of the American Legal Academy. Across 25 books and more than 400 articles, Berman did pioneering work in comparative legal studies, Russian law and culture, legal philosophy, private international law, and of course, law and religion. In fact, he was in many ways the founding father of this interdisciplinary field. The Berman Lecture honors his intellectual legacy, and today's lecture is a fitting tribute to that legacy as it addresses one of the great themes of Professor Berman's work, the nature of religious and political authority. The nature of authority is an enduring question in both law and religion. On what basis are some chosen to lead, to teach, to adjudicate, to govern the lives of others? On what grounds should the disciple, the congregant, the initiate, the constituent, the citizen adhere to the directives and guidance of those in positions of authority? These questions are endemic to every community but they bear a special relevance to the study of law and religion. With the advent of the modern state, in particular the religiously plural modern state, the community of the state's inhabitants must ask anew, whence comes the authority of the state's law? Is the authority of the law grounded in religion? If the authority of the law is not religious, can and should the law exert authority over religion? Many of us here tonight will be familiar with the broad outline of how these questions are answered in the American Constitution. The authority of the state's law comes from the people by virtue of the democratic process. Religion should be disestablished, separated in important ways from the state, but the state's authority to regulate religion is limited by the principle of free exercise. That is, that summary an extreme simplification of a complex and ongoing debate, but it helps us to set some foundation to inquire about the experience of other communities, such as the Tibetan people, who have a different history, intellectual tradition, and social context that informs the answers to these questions. We are extremely privileged this evening to learn about the Tibetan experience from Dr. Lapsang Sangye, the Sikyong of the Sit of the Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration. Dr. Sangye was born and grew up in a Tibetan settlement near Darjeeling, where he attended the Central School for Tibetans. He completed his BA with honors and LLB degrees from Delhi University, and in 1992, he was elected as the youngest executive member of the Tibetan Youth Congress. Dr. Sangye came to the US on a Fulbright scholarship in 1996 to study at Harvard Law School where he completed his Master of Laws degree, as well as his Doctor of Juridical Science in 2004. His dissertation, Democracy in Distress, Is Exile Polity a Remedy? 
a case study of Tibet's government in exile, was awarded the Yang K. Kim 95 Prize for its excellence. Dr. Sangay remained at Harvard following his degrees, first as a research fellow and then as a senior fellow until early 2011. In 2011, he was elected to the post of Kelan Tripa, the head of the Kashag, or executive cabinet, of the Central Tibetan Administration. The 2011 democratic election for the Kelan Tripa, with voting held throughout the Tibetan diaspora, was only the third such election following 2001 constitutional reforms that inaugurated popular elections. On August 8, 2011, during Dr. Sangay's swearing-in ceremony as Kelan Tripa, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama said, quote, when I was young, an elderly regent, Takhtrag Rinpoche, handed over Sikyong, political leadership, to me, and today I am handing it over, I am handing over Sikyong to young Lapsang Sangay. In doing this, I have fulfilled my long-cherished goal, end of quote. This statement from the Dalai Lama inaugurated additional constitutional reforms for the CTA, resulting in the devolution of political power from the office of the Dalai Lama to the office of the elected Sikyong. Dr. Sange has both studied exilic democracy and been at the center of democratic and secularizing changes within the Tibetan community and government. With his re-election as Sikyong in 2016, he continues to oversee these developments for the widespread Tibetan diaspora. We are privileged to hear from a speaker with such profound insight into the Tibetan people's experience and the broader questions of the balance between religious and political authority. It is my honor to invite to the podium our 2018 Harold J. Berman lecturer, Dr. Lapsang Sangay Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration. Hello, everybody. I need to hear a little loudly the response. Can I say hello? hello. Because I think it's 4.45 a.m. in India. So I just flew from India, so lest I go to sleep, uh, I thought, you know, my request is that each time I make a point, do clap it as loudly as possible <laughs> so that I can come back from sleep. Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, Silas Adad for being so kind and persistent uh, in inviting me here. It's been, I think, two years of work. Um, but finally, I made it here to Emory after 15 years. So, you know, I was looking forward to visiting here and see some sites. Uh, but then tomorrow morning, I have to leave for DC, and seeing sites will be next time. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the director, John Whitty, for, uh, for being a kind host and also letting me uh, use his office uh, so that I can doze off for 20 minutes before coming here. So I'll be at least fresh for 20 minutes. So it's a great privilege and honor to, uh, for me to deliver the 2018 Berman Lecture. I want to acknowledge the faculty, the school, and especially the donors for being so generous and kind in making this uh, lecture a possibility. And today's topic uh, is Tibetan transition to uh, secular democracy. As uh, Silas uh, started with uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama, perhaps maybe I'll start the story uh, with him um, because it has, uh, from academic point of view, a political point of view, this topic has multi-dimensional. Uh, and uh, perhaps I can list some uh, that will put in context the Tibetan transition to secular democracy. And I think much of the credit uh, goes to uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama because the main transition happened in 2010. As you know, for more around 500 years, the Dalai Lamas have been the political and spiritual leader of uh, Tibetan people. And in 2010, uh, we had this general body meeting of all the Tibetans from around the world. 
because His Holiness had decided uh, to separate the church and the state or delegate uh, political authority to whoever uh, gets elected. And then in the final effort, Tibetans uh, met and passed a resolution, the resolution number one, that His Holiness should at least stay on as or like the constitutional king of England. That was the request, that he was going to delegate all his political authority, but at least remain like the Queen of England. You know, so we just said constitutional king of England. When the resolution was presented to him, this is like you know, five, six hundred people gathering together and our wisdom prevailing and the resolution passed. When it was presented to him, he said, oh, you want me to be like the king of England? And we all said, yes, your holiness, at least stay on. Then first bring me a queen. <laughs> Suddenly we realized the 600 collective wisdom was such a nonsense. How can you ask a monk to be like a king, you know? So that's the futility of the resolution. It was dropped and uh, he completely delegated his political authority. And fortunately, unfortunately, I happened to get elected around that time. So I'll come to the story later. Uh, now, he was the one who decided uh, to you know, have the Tibetan community transition to uh, secular democracy from Dalai Lama-led government to a secular or directly elected Sikyong, which is my position. Now, in the global context, uh, Again, it's complicated, but also interesting. Because as we see, the decline of internationalism and liberalism now, at least for a decade, maybe two decades now, and the rise of nationalism and extremism. So that's the ideological, philosophical conflicts or context we are in. Hence, you know, from late 80s, 1990s, with the rise of internationalism and liberalism, Democracy was all good, universal accepted principle, and human rights was accepted by around the world. Nowadays, it's being challenged by rise of nationalism and extremism. You can see the conflicts uh, in Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Boko Haram uh, in Africa, or you know, uh, from uh, southern a part of Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, where Rohingyas are also um, repressed uh, or brutalized by Buddhists as well. So you can see all these conflicts. So in this context, where democracy is not necessarily the most popular thing nowadays, to transition to democracy, and with the rise of nationalism and extremism, to transition to secular state is very unique, and that's happening in the Tibetan context. Um, now, you must understand why it is unique and interesting. It's also because the Tibetan democracy the, or the secular democracy we are talking about, it's, you know, it's an exile setup. It is also unique because if you study any exile governments, uh, African National Congress, or East Timor, uh, or any other exiled governments in history, most of them had democratic, the spirit of democracy, but not practice of democracy. Because once you're in exile, the very purpose of exile and democracy, if not in conflict, there is contradiction between the two. Because you're in exile, what you emphasize is unity, Single leader, single voice, understandable, because you are in exile, because your purpose is to return. Hence, you have a single goal, and uh, single voice, and single leader, and unity is paramount. But once you have democracy, and there is a contradiction, because instead of unity, in democracy you must have diversity. Instead of single leader, in democracy, you must have opposition parties. Instead of single voice, you must have freedom of speech. 
So hence, there is a contradiction between exile and democracy. And hence, it's very unique and challenging that we Tibetans are practicing a contradictory philosophy principle uh, at play. And also, among the you know, 60 million refugees or diaspora around the world, it's not just Tibetan, now, there are in total 60 million refugees and diaspora around the world. You will find any of the refugee community practicing democracy because for them, survival is key. Survival is uh, key. Hence, welfare system, distribution mechanism are the fundamental challenge. Livelihood is the fundamental challenge that they face. So if you go to Kenya, there is a refugee camp of 400,000 refugees in one place. And for the last 20, 30 years, they are essentially surviving in tents. Even, even now, their schools are run in tents. Uh, their hospitals run in tents, you know. But in the Tibetan context, our, our uh, system is well established. We have our own government. We have three pillars of democracy, uh, judiciary, executive, and parliament. And our parliament is very robust. Um, for example, we just had our parliamentary uh, session. The unique thing about Tibetan democracy is that we have 45 members of parliament. They can ask any number of questions, and the minister has to answer immediately, impromptu. So the record is that the home Kalun answered around 300 questions for three days in a row. The education minister answered 260 some questions for two and a half days in a row where you will find the executive so accountable and transparent that any member of parliament can ask any number of questions. Even uh, in England, the House of Commons debate is very well known around the world. It's broadcast live. But normally, debate hours one hour or two hours. And the questions are submitted beforehand, and answers are written by bureaucrats, and the prime minister comes and reads. And the follow-up questions is where the challenges are, but it won't last more than an hour and two hours. But in our system, we have to answer two to three hundred questions. I just answered hundred questions recently. Even me as the president, we have to answer. So it's very unique that you won't find. So all three pillars of democracy and uh, you know, the exiled government that we have, the Auditor General is the most powerful office, not the judiciary, not the parliament. Why, for example, I flew in here. By the way, normally I fly economy class because Tibetan administration is the most frugally run administration anywhere in the world. And the first thing that I worry when I board the plane is not my hand luggage or even passport, but my boarding card. Because if I don't have boarding card, I won't get reimbursed. <laughs> now imagine. My salary is only $400 a month, right? And the ticket costs you $2,000. If I lose my t boarding card, that's half the year of my salary. So I want to thank Emory Law School and the Berman, uh, who endowed the Berman Lecture for paying business class this time. So someone was suggesting, can I change my ticket? I said, it's business class. I don't want to change my ticket because if I prepone or postpone, I'd be paying half my salary, you know? So I just want to thank. Uh, so they, even they were so polite, you know, we offer business class. I hope it's okay for me. I said, it's all right. <laughs> but in seven, I'm in, my, I'm in my second term. In seven years, this is my second time I'm flying business class. So I feel a little more rested than normal, yeah, thanks to Emory Law School. So, you know, this is the most frugally run administration that you'll find anywhere. Um, and then our budget is around 25 to 30 million dollars a year. And we cater to 150,000 uh, Tibetans. We run 72 schools. Uh, we have 14 or so hospitals. And 262 monasteries and nunneries. You can see monk and nuns are present quite well in this room also. But again, that number uh, is a little misleading in the sense of the 42,000 monks and nuns, 
58% are from the Himalayan region, so you have to include a whole lot of Indian population. And also, of the remaining 48% Tibetans, I think 95% are from Tibet, who escaped from Tibet, came to India to, to join the monastic community. So it's misled, but the huge population. So we run our own schools. I studied in Tibet refugee school, like many of in the audience. So, you know, this is the most frugally and efficiently run government and a democratic one. So one thing you should be, you know, we all should be very proud. So this is among the 60 million refugees. And I think by far with, you know, I studied, I spent 16 years in America. So I can keep aside my Tibetan humility and be a little American and say among the 60 million refugees in diaspora, this is the best run and frugally run government anywhere in the world. So can I use the American side of it, right? <laughs> so that's the American side of me, okay, because I have to make sure the Tibetans don't feel a little insulted. He's, oh, he's no more humble, right? He's very American. So this is very unique. Hence, there's a multi-dimension to this, but now coming to the secularism or secular side of uh, Tibetan democracy, we have to go back to the origin of our nation, Tibet. The myth says that our first forefather was a monkey, and a first mother was an ogress. So they met, and the Tibetan people came to this world. There's a bit of an evolutionary theory. It's a monkey, you know. But then there's ogres too, right? And by the, by the forest in the Brahmaputra River, they made some in caves or whatever happened. So we came as a Tibetan race. But then the myth says that the monkey was a manifestation of Buddha of compassion, genesis. And ogres was a manifestation of goddess Tara. So you can clearly see that. Now, you come to 2011, when His Holiness Dalai Lama divided church and the state. When you secularize the Tibetan system, means you, you are also taking step away from the very identity of Tibet as a nation, right? So hence, this is a big transformation or transition. Number two, we also believe that all the kings of Tibet were also manifestation of Buddha of compassion. So hence, when they uh, explain to you the three great kings of Tibet, they are also called Dharma kings, spiritual kings, spiritual rulers. Now, when you transition to secular system, you are also taking a step uh, away from the Dharma kings of Tibet. So you, again, not just the myth or the origin of Tibet as a nation, but also the kings and in the historical context, we are again removing a step uh, away. And all the Dalai Lamas, we had 14 Dalai Lamas, right? And Dalai Lamas were both spiritual and political leaders of Tibet. Now, when he said he was going to separate the church and the state and devolve all his political authority, we are making that transition as well. So in that sense, the Tibetan transition to secular democracy is as real as it can get. It's not just simply a separation of church and state. Step away from nation, step away from Dharma kings, step away from the Dalai Lamas of Tibet. So it's a big deal. Hence, you know, in the normal study of secularism or secular or secularization, this could be, you know, one more field where people might be interested. Now, let me come to the story, how it all happened. In 1959, Tibet was invaded and occupied by the Chinese Communist Party's army. And in 1960, the very first year we came to exile, His Holiness Dalai Lama said, we must have democracy. Like, can you imagine you just lost your country and you're in exile? Livelihood is the first thing you must think of. But His Holiness said, no, we must have constitutional democracy. That's what we're going to practice. And we set up a Tibetan parliament, a democratic one. And the Tibetan parliament had to represent and reflect Tibet as a country, 
Hence, we had representative of all three provinces, Yutsang, Kham, and Namdo, and all four Buddhist sects, Geluk, Nyingma, Saikya, and Kajuk, and Pen religion. So all were represented in the parliament in 1960, just a year after we uh, came to India. Then in 1963, you know, his Holiness was so advanced in thinking, he said, we must have women representation in the parliament also. So we had women representation in the Tibetan parliament in 1963. That's ahead of Switzerland and some countries in Europe, because they had women representation in the parliament only in 1970s. And now, I think the women representation in the Tibetan parliament is around 21% which is, again, two percentage more than the U.S. Congress. It's doing pretty well, right? And then, so, so on and so forth. And then in 2001, we had direct election of my position before it was called Kalyun Tripa, now Sikyong, and 2006, and 2011, where I ran for election, and 2016, where I ran for re-election. So I'm in my second and final term. Uh, which also means I'm available after three years. <laughs> so if you're looking for cheapest president who will fly around in economy class, you know, so if there are some position available, you know, you can easily uh, get my address. <laughs> so I've been saying that all over the world, so let's, you know, if there's election which coincides with 2021, I might jump ship and run for another election in get my own private plane and all that. You know, that, that is my, that's my dream, anyways. And then uh, the beauty of sec not just secular, but also Tibetan democracy is, from 2006 to 16, in the last 10 years, the voter registration and participation in demo Tibetan democracy increased by 70%. Now, if, you, if anyone who's studying democracy, what you find is that there's a decline of voter registration and voter participation in all the major democracies around the world, including in America. I'm, just, I'm sorry to say that. But in our community, 70% increase. Isn't that amazing? Right? Not only that, in our democracy, voting is not free. You have to pay. So you have to pay what we call, it's an oxymoron, okay? Voluntary freedom tax. It's a tax for freedom, but it's voluntary. <laughs> but it's not voluntary, why? Because if you don't pay, you don't get to vote. So 70% have paid to vote. So that's Tibetan democracy. So there's a 70% increase. And at the same time, in, the, in that, 70%, you know, there's a bit of a Americanized participation and Indianized participation, meaning they're quite vocal and brutal sometimes in social network when it comes to my position. They're quite critical. The disadvantage I had was, till 2011, whoever was elected, because His Holiness Dalai Lama was also the political leader, he makes the decision Right? And he goes to his Solonist Dalai Lama and gets a signature. Once you get his, his Solonist Dalai Lama signature, you can show it to Tibetans and say, you know, look at the decision, it's signed by his Solonist Dalai Lama. You criticize, there's a danger that you might go to hell, you know. So no one criticizes you. Now, I don't have that signature, you see. I make the decision, I consult him, but constitutionally, now I have to sign it myself. And I show it to people, I said, it's signed by me. And they yeah. <laughs> then you're wrong, you know. <laughs> Before the decision is read, they think it's wrong. So there's element of that criticism as well. But freedom of speech is part of democracy, so which is okay. But this is Tibetan democracy. So hence, the beauty of Tibetan democracy and the secular system that we adopt, adopted it's really challenging. It's in, in some sense a lab case for new democracy, democracy in exile. Why I say this is if you study Robert Dahl or Huntington and others, you know, uh, including Putnam, they say 
No state, no democracy. Democracy assumes state. But in our context, there is no state. We are in exile. Tibetans are scattered in 40 countries. So it's a democracy without borders. And then in the last two elections, in the last four elections, even though we don't have a state, Tibetans in 40 countries all vote. How the Tibetan democracy or administration function is that my cabinet makes a decision and we send the notice to Tibetans around the world, they all follow. Even though they are a small group of 60 Tibetans in Atlanta, we are so far away, exiled government, we don't have police, we don't have prison, there's no punishment if you don't follow what we say. But yet, they have a weekend school, they teach their own, some of the advice that we give, they all follow. Ten mass statement we sent, and they read, you see. So, it's very unique and beautiful that normally state is effective because they have an uh, institution or system of caution. They can use police and military to enforce laws. We don't have. Yet it functions uh, quite effectively. So that's also very unique. Now the story goes like this. Now I'll come to my personal journey, which, is, which will make it a bit interesting. So personally, I grew up, um, my parents came from Tibet uh, in 1959 with the Solonis Dalai Lama and 80,000 Tibetans. So I was born and brought up in a place called Darjeeling, which is known for tea. Many of the Europeans know, but not many Americans know. It's considered, Darjeeling is considered the best tea. And then went to refugee school, why I mentioned this is, you know, a refugee school run by Tibetan government. And then went to Delhi University. Fortunately, I got Fulbright scholarship. Then I did my master's degree in law at Harvard Law School and did my doctorate degree there. Then I was happily employed for seven years. Altogether, I spent 17 years in Boston. And I'm a full-fledged, I'm sorry to say, New England Patriots fan. I'm, just, I'm glad no one is throwing anything at me. You know? So I'm sure you all are happy that we lost Super Bowl this time. And also Red Sox fan. So after 16 years uh, in Boston area in 2011, uh, there was election for my position, the president of Tibet administration, and I ran for it. Now the challenge was, you know, your mother loves you the most, but even my mother did not think I would win. Because the other candidates were former prime minister, a speaker, deputy speaker, parliament, seasoned diplomat, private secretary, his solemnness, Dalai Lama, all senior to me. They were the veterans and the giants of Tibetan politics. And I was the youngest, least or zero experience in politics and administration, and I ran, and my, even my mother didn't give me a chance. So I, I went to my friends and said, you know, give me some advice. Should I run or not? First, I went to my best friend, and uh, he looked at me and said, you know, you have never served a single day in Tibetan government, not even as a lowly bureaucrat or a secretary, or a member of parliament, or a minister, you're going for the top post? And I said, yes. And he said, I've been serving for 20 years. I'm, I even hesitated. I'm hesitating to run for member of parliament or not. Where is this coming from? I said, well, that's the American side of me coming from, you know. <laughs> so he was not giving me encouragement at all. He was saying, I'm hesitating after 20 years of service to run even for a member of parliament. You are going for the top post, no chance. Then I went to my second friend. And he looked at me and said, Lopsang, are you sure you want to run? I said, yes. Then what you need is first an exit strategy. <laughs> because you have to assume you lose. Get an exit strategy, then run. Then I went to my third friend. I was very desperate. I said, all these friends are giving me this kind of advice. What should I do? He's a businessman. And he said, Lopsang, you should run. I said, why? I thought he might give me a very good reason. He said, well, you have nothing to lose, you know. <laughs> Just go for it. 
So with that encouragement, I ran, right? And lo and behold, I won. Now how I won and how the election was run, this is very important because Tibetan administration is not just frugally run, is not just the most effective and efficient government or administration uh, among exile, uh, you know, exile or refugees or diaspora, but this is a labor of love also. You know, the sense of collective responsibility is very much practiced. And then sense of respect for each other is very much there. So other two candidates within the Tedong La and Tash Mongdila, very senior in the final round. So we had a debate in Dharamsala. The next day the debate was in Delhi. So then the Tedong La, we looked at each other and said, oh, we have to go to Delhi for this, another round of debate. I said, yes. Uh, how are you going to go? I said, oh, not yet planned. And the organizers came and said, okay, we all are going to Delhi together and we have hired a taxi for four of us in one taxi. <laughs> now where in the world you'll find two final candidates, okay, driving in the same taxi? So we drove whole night. The taxi driver was, it seems, quite tired. The Tizitadonla was from California, I was from Boston. So we found that this taxi driver was following Indian traffic rule, which is green light, drive, yellow light, yellow light, keep driving, red light, look, keep driving. <laughs> then he said, no, no, you know, stop <laughs> by the highway, because he was dozing off, right? Then finally we got uh, in Majdugatila. Then obviously, again, Tibetans are, you know, very spiritual in mindset, a little laid back also. The organizers had forgot to book rooms. So at 2 a.m. they were knocking hotel rooms, trying to find a room. Finally, they got two rooms, one for organizer, one for two candidates. So we slept together, okay. <laughs> so next day we had breakfast together. So in that restaurant, Tibetan people were looking at us, like as to what the hell is happening, because they were debating among themselves which candidate to support or not to support. And here we are, two candidates having debate and chatting, you know and having breakfast together and chatting. And then we had uh, a second round of debate and we gave each other camping tips and went our ways. So our contribution to secular democracy around the world is to all the candidates, Democratic or Republican, you can share taxes together, you can share rooms together, you can have breakfast together, and you will save a lot of money. <laughs> no? Now it is presidential election in America, it's like billion dollar for per candidate. Congressmen and women, I mean, $10 million. Without that, if you don't have $20, $30 million, you didn't get elected as a senator. Tibet election, share taxi together, room together, breakfast together, give each other campaign tips. It doesn't cost anybody anything, and you get a better candidate. Can I say that? Ultimately, whoever gets elected. So that's our contribution. This is a very Buddhist way of democratic system. Yes or no? Yes. Now I'm here in Emory. Tomorrow I'll be in DC for four days. During my absence in seven days, right? A Tibetan administration back in Dharamsala, they're running. Now what happens is that we have a system it's like presidential system. I get elected, then I appoint cabinet members. So they don't have public mandate, but I appointed them. The day they appointed, what happens is that we practice Buddhist notion of collective leadership, meaning they are equally empowered. So during my absence, if there are four members are there in the cabinet, they can make any decision they want. They can reverse my decision, overrule my decision. Where in the world you will find that? Normally, either president or prime minister is elected. In their absence, cabinet meeting is never held. Because you want to give contract to someone, you want to give job to someone, you want to give something to someone, right? And in the absence, during the absence of prime ministers, or chief ministers, or governor, or president, cabinet meeting is never held. But in our system, 
My absence doesn't mean a thing. They'll go on making all the decisions. So I have to go back and complain. I said, why did you reverse my decision? They said, yeah, we decided it was not the right one, so we reversed your decision. So again, we practice that because why? Once I appoint my team, the idea is that I should trust the team and team should trust me. Again, this is based on what in uh, uh, Buddhism also in the Vinaya tradition, uh, Vinaya uh, discipline, they have this collective leadership and consensus leadership. So even in my presence, when we make decision, 90 plus percent of the time, decision are reached on consensus. If someone is not there um, from the education department, then we don't make decision regarding the department because we wait for uh, the participation of the minister. So this is how we rule things. So you know, it's very unique. So that's our uh, contribution uh, to the, uh, what do you call, democratic world. And now I started by saying, you know, with the decline of internationalism and liberalism, rise of nationalism and extremism, you know, this is a challenging time. Uh, for the whole world. And uh, in the recent 19 party Congress of China, uh, President Xi Jinping has declared that Xi Jinping thought is essentially socialism with Chinese characteristic in new era. So that's the philosophy of geology. It's on the table for the whole world, which essentially means one party system. No democracy. At least Deng Xiaoping said there should be democracy in China in 50 years' time. Prime Minister Wen Jiabao said democracy is inevitable. There will be democracy in China. But now Xi Jinping has essentially said socialism with Chinese characteristic in new era means no democracy, one party rule. In, and that what China is going to bring in the international frontier. So decline of internationalism, liberalism, rise of nationalism, extremism, and China's proposal of socialism with Chinese characteristic, it's on the tables, it's all mixed. So ideologically or philosophically speaking, we are in a very challenging times. And also from the point of reincarnation point of view, because you know, as you were asking. I started with Dalai Lama. Now in 2008, the Chinese government has declared that any Lama is to be recognized as a reincarnated Lama. First, they must be registered and recognized by the Communist Party of China. If you are not registered and recognized by the Communist Party of China, then you are not a reincarnated Lama. This is a setup to have their say or their picked of the next Dalai Lama. So this is where we are. Here we are in exile, we are practicing secular democracy and there in China, the Chinese government, the Communist Party is interested in selecting a spiritual leader. Now look at the track record of the Chinese government. In 1950s, essentially 60s, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were disrupted. Now this data or facts are based on 70,000 characters petition submitted by late Pension Lama to Mao Zedong. As you might know, Pension Lama is the second most well-known Lama in the Tibetan world who stayed on in Tibet. And based on information submitted by Tibetans from all over, he submitted a formal petition to Mao Zedong. And it's called 70,000 characters. Later, Mao Zedong labeled that as poison arrow. In that petition, 98% of monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were destroyed. That's the track record. 
Even now, as we speak, Larungar Monastery, which had 12,000 monks and nuns, was demolished from August 2016 to August 2017 and reduced to 5,000 monks and nuns. And three nuns committed suicide. As we speak, Yachingar Nunnery had five to 6,000 nuns is being demolished and reduced to two or 3,000 nuns. And whole life in the last 60 years, the Chinese government has criticized his Solonist Dalai Lama. They have called him a lot of names, including a devil. Now they are saying they must have a final say in recognizing the Dalai Lama. Now His Solonist Dalai Lama has said, if Chinese government is so interested in recognizing or selecting spiritual leaders, first they must select the reincarnation of Mao Zedong and Teng Xiaoping and Zhao Enlai, because they have done, contributed quite a bit to China as a country. Once they do that, then they might have some credibility in recognizing spiritual leaders like Dalai Lama. And also, Chinese government think that they can recognize reincarnated lamas, and Tibetans in particular and world in general will accept it. It's almost like saying Rahul Castro selecting a pope and expecting all the Catholics to follow. What are the chances the Catholics will follow the pope? Or Rahul Castro selecting a rabbi or a swami and expecting all the Jewish people, people of Jewish faith or you know, uh, Hindus to follow. Very unlikely. So with that kind of track record of the Chinese government, it's very unlikely that the you know, world in general will follow, particularly Tibetans will not follow. Because spirituality is a matter of heart and mind. Even though we are transitioning to secular democracy, but religion and spirituality is a matter of heart and mind. You cannot force, you cannot buy. But that's the uh, Chinese government plan. So this is the challenge we are facing in coming years as well. Hence, the Solonist Dalai Lama's idea of transitioning Tibetan democracy to secular democracy was precisely that, that the Tibetan movement, the exile government, be led by democratically elected leader so that the Tibetan movement can carry on moving forward and not be dependent on one person. That's Dalai Lama or the institution of Dalai Lama. So hence, the idea of secular democracy came from that perspective also, and hence this is his Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, contribution uh, to the Tibetan uh, people and Tibetan movement. Now, the function of Tibetan uh, government exile, as I said, is frugally run and quite an effective one. For example, the literacy rate of Tibetan refugees in India below the age of 60, because we lost our country 60 years ago, the literacy rate is 94%. The India's literacy rate is anywhere from 76% to 84%, which depends which uh, data you go by, but better than India, which is a host country, better than Nepal, better than Bangladesh, in the whole of South Asian region, I think even though we are exiled, but our literacy, literacy rate is very high, because number one priority of Tibetan administration as envisioned and advised by His Solonist Dalai Lama is education. So I'm standing here on my, on my feet because of education that was given by Tibetan government exile. I come from a, quite a poor family, actually. My parents had one acre of land. And uh, you know, all my winter vacation, two months, I spent in the forest cutting grass for our cows. I know how to milk cows cutting wood for home. So that's the literacy rate. And then, you know, we got education. And also, Tibetans in exile, especially in India, we just observed Thank You India event uh, in Dharamsala. When I meet with, you know, uh, Indian officials, when I go and say thank you 
for all the support they have rendered. Because what India has done, India has done the most for Tibetan people. In fact, they say thank you to us. Also because they say among all the refugee groups in India, we are a success story. Really, we still follow our Buddhist principles and norms. In the last 40 years, you know, Tibetans uh, do business, or in, not business, but a roadside uh, sale of cardigans in winter. And they buy their sweaters or cardigans from Indian wholesalers. In the last 40 years, this business has been going on. Tibetans go there and make 20% you know, 20, 20 advance payment and 80% they get a loan. If you contribute 20,000 20, rupees, you get 80,000 rupees loan. If you contribute 100,000 rupees, you get you know, 500,000 rupees loan, half million rupees loan. But then this loan is very unique. There is no collateral. There is no lawyers involved in drafting agreement. It's just on a basis of name. What's your name? John, house number six. Where do you live? Atlanta. That's it, on a piece of paper. And that's how the transaction has taken place. And I went and asked this Indian you know, wholesalers, and why do you do this? They said, no, Tibetans are honest. They're imandari hai. And hence, this transaction has been going on. So even though we are refugees, we do not have a country, but we follow Buddhist principles and norms, and we try to be as honest as possible in our transaction as well. So that's reflected in our society, that's reflected in our government, that's reflected in our uh, movement uh, as well. Hence, by and large, what I'm trying to say is that even though, as per the vision of His Holiness Dalai Lama, we have transitioned from Dalai Lama rule, Tibet, to a secular system. But the morals and the ethics and the principles of Buddhism is very much practiced by Tibetans. So in secular, in institutional and constitutional mechanism, but in function, still a Buddhist community uh, and Buddhist movement and a nonviolent one. Finally, let me end by saying the, our movement is based on nonviolence Hence, the solution that we propose is also through dialogue. And what we seek from China is genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people. Meaning, what we're proposing is a win-win solution. China says sovereignty and territorial integrity cannot be compromised, cannot be negotiated. One China cannot be negotiated. And Tibetans are saying, okay, give us genuine autonomy and repression of the Tibetan people genuine autonomy as per Chinese laws, then we will take that as a win-win proposition. So we are not seeking separation from China if we are granted genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people. Again, this is based, and it's called middle way approach. Again, this is also based on Buddhist notion of finding a middle ground of two views. That is repression of the Tibetan people and separation from China. So this is a solution. Hopefully, it's acceptable to the Chinese government, and hopefully it will be achieved. If and when it is achieved, we get to see the return of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to Tibet and basic freedom for Tibetan people. As you might know, in the last 10 years, 152 Tibetans have burned themselves, committed self immolation now, we discourage self immolation categorically, consistently, but it is still continuing. We just had few self immolation last year, and we just had one this year. Still continue, that form of resistance is continuing. And their sole aspiration or demand is as follows they want to see the return of His Holiness Dalai Lama to Tibet and freedom for Tibetan people. I hope the aspirations of six millions in Tibet will be realized, and there will be a win win solution for government and people of China and people of Tibet. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Sungay. Uh, we do have some time for question and answer. There are two microphones at the aisles. Uh, so if folks have questions, uh, please queue up at one of the microphones and uh, we'll take, take questions. There we go. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, with China's south-north uh, water transfer system, and, and specifically the proposed western branch, uh, going from the Yangshi over the Tibetan Plateau, what the role of Chinese infrastructure development is in the prospect of a free Tibet, whether you see you know, Chinese actions in terms of infrastructure and, and water rights in general as you know, an indication that uh, the government isn't uh, as willing to, to go forward with um, sovereign, not sovereignty, but, but uh, Tibetan rights, or, or, or not? Yes. Uh, thank you. That's a very important question. Because, you know, the topic is a transition to secular democracy. So I was trying to stick to democracy and, you know, uh, secularism. But I was trying to stretch it a bit to a larger Tibetan issue. Sure. Uh, but this is a very important question. Uh, you know, Tibet is not simply an issue of six million Tibetans, uh, but an issue for the whole world, particularly for Asia, in the context of environment and water. Tibet is called third pole, even by Chinese environmentalists. Chinese environmentalists have suggested, recommended that Tibet be declared a third pole national park. Essentially, what they're saying is Tibet is so fragile and important for China that it has to be preserved and protected. Because after Antarctica and Arctic, Tibet has the largest amount of ice or glaciers. Now, the difference is Antarctica and Arctic, when they melt, it goes to ocean. But as far as Tibetan glaciers are concerned, when they melt, it forms water, rivers, and hence the 10 largest rivers of Asia flow from you know, Tibet as the water tower. Indus River, Satlas River, which is vital, actually which are vital for India, state of Kashmir, and Pakistan. The term India comes from Indus River, but 40% of that Indus River is actually the snow or the glaciers melted uh, from the Tibetan plateau. Brahmaputra is vital for Bangladesh and northeast of India, comes from Tibet. Mekong River, Irrawaddy River, Salwen River, we all know about Mekong Delta because of the Vietnam War. Actually, Mekong River starts from Tibet. Yellow River and Yangtze River, Yellow River, the cradle of Chinese civilization, starts from Tibet. So you can clearly see 1.4 billion people depend on water flowing from uh, Tibetan plateau. And not just that, uh, Tibet, because it's called roof of the world, is so high, it also functions as the uh, refrigerator or cooler uh, for rest of the world, because the jet stream over Tibet affects climate all the way to America. Uh, in fact, there's scientists in Quebec who have said whether the winter is warm or cold in Canada is dependent on, partly dependent on uh, Tibetan Plateau. A scientist in California has said, unless you know the Tibetan Plateau, you won't have full understanding of global warming and climate change. So is that vital? The problem is, in the last 70 years, 50% of Tibetan glaciers have melted and disappeared. Right? According to NASA, by 2100, up to 70% of Tibetan glaciers will melt and disappear. 
Now the problem is this. At the moment, there are 42,000 glaciers on the Tibetan plateau. Now if 70% is to disappear, what will happen to 1.4 billion people who depend on water flowing from Tibet? Right? Now in China, you have 19% of the world population, but only 12% of fresh water, which means already 7% or equivalent of 400 million Chinese are facing water scarcity now scarcity of fresh water. Situation in Bangladesh is worse, situation in India is worse, Nepal, Pakistan, you just name it in ASEAN countries. Now, Tibet is the water tower. Hence, Chinese environmentalists are also saying, we have to declare Tibet as a third pole national park and we have to protect it. You know? So this is the challenge from water point of view. And the worst challenge is as follows. Two-thirds of Tibetan plateau is permafrost, which means frozen earth. Okay? Now, if 70% of the glaciers of Tibet melt, then Tibet as a plateau warms up. And what happens is the permafrost start also started defreezing or starts warming up, right? The frozen earth warm up. Underneath Tibet is, is estimated that 10,000 million tons of carbon dioxide is underneath. So when it defreezes, if that carbon dioxide is released, you can forget about you know, global warming as we speak. Even if whole of Atlanta or Georgia stops driving, starts walking, temperature will shoot up multiple times. Now the worst part is Underneath the Tibetan plateau, there is equal amount of methane, right? And methane is 30 times more powerful and worse off than carbon dioxide. If that is released, the whole world will be a heater. It will be so hot, so warm. Ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer, all that will happen. So hence, Tibet is vital for Asia, for water, and the rest of the world, for climate change and global warming and everything. Hence, it's very important that the Tibetan plateau has to be protected. And you're right. The Chinese government has not signed the UN Convention of Water Sharing. So hence, as you said, if the water starts rivers being diverted from south to north, meaning if the Brahmaputra, Salvin, Irawa, they all are diverted up northwards towards China, and they are already facing water scarcity. What will happen to people in downstream? Millions survive on fishery and agriculture because of Tibetan water. What will happen to them? So it's a major crisis because China is not obligated to share water because they have not signed UN Convention water sharing. So hence, you know, when it comes to water and climate of Tibet, the, the uh, glaciers of Tibet, it's very important for the world to say for the last hundreds and hundreds of years, Tibetan people of the Tibetan plateau had ownership over the land and water. For example, if the state of Georgia wants to build a highway through some villages of Georgia, then you will consult the villages and say, are we permitted or not? And should, how much should we compensate or not? Right? Similarly, Tibetan people should be consulted when it comes to water sharing, when it comes to permafrost, when it comes to uh, glaciers. If you do that, then Tibetans will have a say. So if you just go by sovereignty, then Beijing will have the final say. And the Tibetan views will be uh, secondary or not even considered. Right? And here I want to make another point because if there is one degree increase in temperature in the rest of the world, it, it doubles in Tibet because so fragile and so high. Now what's happening is that because of deforestation and mining of Tibetan minerals, gold, copper, uranium, you just name it, it's all there. There are 136 different kinds of minerals in Tibet. And the largest uh, reserve of lithium 
is in Tibet. 70%, I think it's estimated 70% of lithium in China comes from Tibet. Now, lithium is used for batteries. So if any one of you are using smartphones made in China, it's very cheap, right, compared to other phones. Why? Because the lithium of Tibet is used for almost free. They extract lithium. And the extraction is very um, complicated because you have to use a lot of heat and almost melt rock to get lithium. Right? In the process, you have to use a lot of chemical. Hence, you pollute Tibetan soil, you pollute Tibetan rivers, you pollute Tibetan air, and essentially, Tibetan, local Tibetans are not compensated, and you get lithium for free or very cheaply, and you use in, you know, in your phones, Chinese-made phones, and hence, the cost of phone is very cheap. So each time you are using Chinese phone, when battery is dying, you should imagine Tibet is dying with it. You know? Hence, uh, because of all this, the temperature in Tibet is increasing, and the glaciers are melting very fast. And then it will have a disastrous consequences for the rest of the world, hence, you know, uh, speaking up and preserving Tibet's environment is vital for the rest of the world as well. So you, give, you ask a short question, and I give you a long answer because you know, I'm, I have to stick to secular democracy, but, but I can go on for another hour if you want. <laughs> but I have to stick so to secular democracy. Yes, there's another question there. I have a very brief question. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, the definition of a Tibetan for the purposes of voting for uh, government officials in exile, and then how that definition uh, will change if the hope for a free Tibet is realized. Definition of Tibetan. Right, for the purposes of, of voting. So what, of purposes what, of voting. Yeah, what, what constitutes a t Tibetan uh, for purposes of voting? Yeah. Um, the definition of Tibetan, I think, is pretty simple. You know, as per our constitution, if one of your parents is Tibetan, you are a Tibetan. Okay. Now, voting is also very simple. You must have Green Book, do you, green, green book uh, what, do call, what do you call it? Green Book, which is voluntary freedom tax. So it doesn't matter, even both your parents are Tibetan, if you don't pay your green book dues, you don't get to vote. <laughs> so you must pay that green book dues, then you get to vote. Yeah. But that's only for if one of your parents is Tibetan. Is that okay? Yeah. And then I was wondering, does that, would that definition uh, change if a free Tibet was realized and there were democratic elections there? Or Inside Tibet? Geography based or? Then it will be geography based inside Tibet. But then, you know, like US or there are many countries where they allow uh, Tibetan citizens around the world to vote. So you could go to, you know, your embassy and vote. Uh, so then the definition of citizenship will be defined in a certain way. And if you fulfill those criteria, you get to vote. I hope then they won't charge you to vote, you know. <laughs> Voting should be free. Thank you. Yeah, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, thank you so very much for this wonderful, wonderful lecture. And uh, really educative, educational, even for us Tibetans also, eye-opening. As a Tibetan, Having heard you really explain the nitty-gritty uh, details of what has really been taking place, despite all of our efforts from the governmental part, from the people's part, all of these sacrifices like 150 plus immol self-immolations, whatnot, we don't see China budging, even an inch, if at all, getting worse and worse and worse. What are we missing? What is there for China to lose if they accept what we offer? What is the crux? Please let us know. Um, because he's a reverend monk, I think. Spiritually speaking, trust is what is missing from the Chinese government side, I think. Because, you know, uh, from our side, I think we can't be 
you know, more moderate and more reasonable than what we are saying. Because as His Holiness Dalai Lama said, historically Tibet was an independent country. We had our own kings, we had our own currencies, we had our own tax system. Not even a single case from Tibetan court has gone to Chinese court ever in history. Uh, so we had our own currency, you know. And hence Tibet was an independent country. In, in, in fact, there's a treaty, there was a treaty in 821 and 23 which said Tibetans will be happy in the land of Tibet, Chinese will be happy in the land of China, signed by Chinese emperor's representative and Tibetan king's representative, right? So that treaty is still there uh, in the form of stone pillar. Uh, but now it's under, Tibet is under occupation and His Solomon's Dalam has been very reasonable. What we're saying, we follow nonviolence, we believe in dialogue, we want the Chinese government to send their representatives and we will have talk and solve the issue of Tibet peacefully. But then I must add, from 2002 to 2010, we did have nine rounds of dialogue between the envoys of the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government representative. And also in 80s, you know, we did have several delegations, Tibetan delegation going to China and had, and had several rounds of informal uh, formal dialogues, but there has been no breakthrough, and it's mainly because of lack of trust from the Chinese government side. So hopefully, the wisdom will prevail, and China has become now very powerful militarily, economically, so hopefully they will trust Tibetan people. We are just 6 million Tibetans, and China's population is 1.3 billion, of which 1.2 billion are Han Chinese, even if you compare Han Chinese population, Tibetan population, we are just half percent. And 99.5 percent should trust half percent, you know. And for every two Tibetans, there will be a young, able-bodied Chinese military personnel with automatic machine guns. We don't stand a chance when it comes to violence or fighting. So hopefully, Chinese leaders, uh, Chinese government will start trusting uh, Tibetan people. On paper, they trust us. On paper, they say, oh, Tibet is transformed into socialist paradise. Tibetans are our brothers and sisters. We are one family. But in practice, it doesn't look like that. So I hope they will practice what they preach and trust us more. If you don't mind, uh, may I follow up on this? Uh, it seems like all we have is hope. And how is this going to really uh, make, a, what do you call, break the ice of their mistrust? Is there any kind of a mechanism or some kind of a insight into how to earn their trust? Uh -huh. I mean, we have done all we can and we concede it, what not? Now, if you study uh, some of the uh, conflict areas, and the solutions they have found from East Timor, Arches to Northern Ireland or East Germany, West Germany, you know. Um, I've often asked this question, what triggered the Good Friday Agreement of Northern Ireland? For example, when you study Northern Ireland when they were fighting, I mean, it's so difficult to imagine that people under one God both believe Jesus Christ but they're fighting and killing each other. And you just say, my goodness, there cannot be any solution to this, right? But then they had Good Friday Agreement and they solved the issue and I asked why? It just happened. Really, it just happens. Archie, there was autonomy, what happened? It just happened. East Timor, you just, you know, go one by one. Example, uh, similar, I was in South Africa. And if you he read the history of South Africa, at least the anti apartheid movement, in late 80s, uh, obituaries were written about Nelson Mandela and said, forget about restoring democracy in South Africa. He cannot free himself from the prison because he spent 28 years in prison and eight years in uh, solitary confinement. And then it happened. He walked free, he got Nobel Peace Prize, democracy restored in South Africa. You ask why? 
It just happens. So similarly, you know, we have to be persistent. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to keep moving forward. Because I get this question all the time. You have such a difficult job. Why did you take this? Because you were at Harvard, you know, drinking Starbucks coffee, reading New York Times, relaxed schedule. Why did you take this schedule, you know, take this job, which is grueling. In the last, in 2017, my assistant uh, gave me my schedule, and I had five days holiday. Of this five days holiday, in the one, one whole year, seven were half days, meaning I returned to Dharamsala that morning. I took the morning off because, you know, after 14 hours of flight, I need you know, four or five hours of sleep to catch up, right? And I have only a day and a half actual holiday. I don't remember where I spent that day and a half. But if you calculate the weekends that I spend working, then it's minus holiday, right? Then I say, why did you take this job? And I always say, my job, in a Buddhist sense, you know, I hope, I always say, you know, Solonists often joke and say, nowadays I believe you have started saying, giving some Buddhist teachings, you know? And I always say, your Holiness, I look around. If there are no monks in the audience, uh, you know, I just throw some Buddhist <laughs> principles. Today we have Reverend, very learned monks here. But essentially, this is how I describe. You know, Buddhist notion of impermanence, you know, you're born and you die. No one can skip death. So what you do in life matters. So, you know, Tibetan, in Buddhist way, you don't start with birth. Actually, you look at death as your ultimate destination, and you take reverse step and say, I'm going to die anyways, so make use of my life and do something good while you live. That's how you think. So that's how I contribute. That's one answer to that question. Why did you take this job? I said, I want to make my life worthwhile. Other point of view is, you know, whenever, whenever there's a beginning, there is an end, right? Similarly, we lost our country, we lost our freedom. It's inevitable that we will restore our freedom. It's both, you know, these two go together. And my job is to connect what we lost to what we should have. So I'm the bridge or the connector. As long as I carry the baton and give it to the next guy, next guy give, us, give it to next woman, and so on and so forth, we will reach the destination. Right? So that's why I always remain hopeful. All I need to do is carry the baton and pass it on. So if you look at Ottoman Empire, if you look at Soviet Union, if you look at Roman Empire or British uh, colonial system, everything that starts ends, and everything that ends starts. You know? So as a Tibetan, we lost our freedom, we will regain our freedom. That's for sure. I'm, there are some Chinese in the audience. You know, I mean, they have right to think we are so powerful, we will remain powerful. Not so. Because historically speaking, we also occupied China once or twice. It's just that it's their turn now. It's okay. So we'll get our turn as well. And ultimately, you know, once you remain hopeful, hope is one thing that keeps you going. And as a monk, I can say, the, you know, if you look at, if you take chances, any day I'll bet on the Tibetan side. Because Buddhism is 2,600 years old. Communism is 100 years old. There's no competition between the two. We have prevailed for 2,600 years. We'll be there for another 2,600 years. Communism will be long gone. No? I think we have a better chance of surviving and reviving our freedom. That, that's how I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we have 10 minutes, no? Ten uh, I think uh, the um, Tibet society you are describing now, it's a really wonderful place, and I think it's even a true fantasy. I think uh, it's definitely because of the power of the religion. Um, but could I ask, uh, is there any institutions that prevents crime and violence and um, such things? And uh, how would you solve the um, inconsistencies of uh, religious beliefs, religious values, 
and the laws uh, when, um, let's say, there's an agreement with the uh, Chinese government, given the context that Chinese government requires, um, like, governing people has no beliefs, since um, it's probably going to be harder to be understanding the differences. Um. If Tibetans are granted autonomy, there will be an agreement. So we'll specify and say Tibetans will have rights to language, rights to culture, rights to environment, rights to administer their own region. And based on that agreement, we, will rem we remain believer, and the Communist Party remain non-believer, but we agree to certain terms based on laws, Chinese laws, and we will, agree, we will implement that. And, uh, Hopefully, uh, so both sides will agree to those terms and agreement and see through it that it's implemented properly. So that's how you come to understanding. Hopefully, I address your question. Yes, the other side will be non-believer, but we remain believer, but the agreement will be the basis through which autonomy will be implemented. Is it okay? I think uh, it's rather a big question to ask. So I think um, uh, it's uh, a really thing that we can be, be, be a little more clear. I think you have something in your mind. I'm not trying to get that. Yeah, what is in, in what context and what example you are asking that question? Um, to be honest, I haven't got a very um, specific example, mm. but uh, I think. Uh, you basically answer my question. Okay. okay. Last two questions, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, my question is, what do you think the role should be of the international community? Being here part of the Emory community, I see that we all enjoy um, the, this aspect from Tibet's religion, uh, the meditation aspect. We've all shared and the benefits of it. What do you think the role should be um, of the international community to help in the struggle of Tibet? Uh, you know, you can do big and small things. Number one, I always uh, recommend that you subscribe to some Tibet-related uh, email list so you're updated from time to time. That's the key. Uh, number two, if there are events, you should participate. You know, engaging is key, and getting information is key. Then you will know what to do, what not to do. And uh, whenever there's a, a small event, or even a coverage in the news media, it's very important that you write to the newspaper or television channel or radio program thanking them for covering something on Tibet. It's very important, it's market driven. So if the managing editor sees there are like 10 emails received by the editor or the newspaper, they think, oh, there are 100 readers. There's a good market they can sell. They write more. Right? So it's very important that you be active. And then, you know, you should call your congressmen and senators from time to time and say, hey, you know, you support certain resolutions, uh, you know, being uh, circulated in... U.S. Congress, for there is a bill on reciprocity that's going on. And there's another bill in the Senate, uh, which will be actually uh, introduced in the next few days. So each time you read about it, and uh, then you, know, you can call your senators, congressmen, and say, I would appreciate if you can support those. And uh, whatever events here, uh, you should participate. But we always advise that events be nonviolent, peaceful, and legal. Don't do anything illegal and violent. I would first like to say uh, uh, and for 18 years I've been told that no question is a dumb question, so I just wanted to ask, uh, since the concept of uh, secular democracy is pretty new to Tibet, do you think that in the future uh, there might be a division between religion and the Tibetan people? There might, will there be a di division yeah. between religion and Tibetan people? Yeah. Um, I think the debate will continue, 
And any culture, any society, it's never static, right? It's always evolving. You know, what is culture is flute. What is secular system is flute. Because it's the notion of secular, uh, the, uh, secularism, even if you look at the evolution of secularism, it has evolved over time. So accordingly, it will evolve. I think in our community also, uh, I think it will evolve. Uh, but I think some form of spirituality, uh, Tibetan values or the Buddhist values will remain. I think, and it should remain. Uh, it's vital, I think that's very important for us as an identity. Um, so I think there's already, uh, you know, this is an age old debate uh, that whether Tibetans were too religious, hence we lost our country, or because of religion, our civilization remained intact, our movement has remained intact, right? So that's an ongoing debate. So whether how much uh, Tibetan Buddhism has contributed to the Tibetan movement or not, it's being debated. But empirically speaking, it has contributed a lot. No? Because if you look around, there are so many Buddhist centers around the world. Those who go to Buddhist centers, they become Tibet sympathizers and they participate in the Tibetan movement. For example, Richard Gere, he was first Buddhist, then Tibet supporter later. So there are a lot of examples like that. So it's an ongoing debate. But I think uh, you know, we will remain quite a spiritual uh, people based on Buddhist values. I do believe so. And because you are the final question, let me end by saying, I gave you the example of, you know, because I don't want you all to go back and thinking, oh, Tibet seems to be a lost cause, you know. Uh, there's no chance, things like that. There's a chance. We do believe this is how we think. As I said, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of Tibetan monks and nuns were destroyed in the 1960s. So when Mao Zedong saw Tibet, they said, hey, we have won. Look at Tibet. No monks, no nuns, no monasteries. We have transformed Tibet into a communist or red China. But in 60 years, what has happened? As per the vision by His Solonis, as per the vision of His Solonis Dalai Lama, brick by brick, we rebuilt monasteries and nunneries in exile. The elder Tibetans worked so hard. And all the major monasteries that were destroyed in Tibet were rebuilt in exile. So you have all the great monasteries in South India and Dehradun all over. And not just that, and we have revived Buddhist civilization or Nalanda tradition in the whole of the Himalayan belt, right? Sikkim, Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, Nepal, Bhutan. The whole of Himalayan belt, Laul, Spiti, and Kinor, all that. And Buddhist centers around the world, including here in Atlanta, at Lusaling centers, around the thousands of Buddhist centers have come up, right? So Buddhism is spread wherever His Holiness visit, visited and beyond. Now, the fourth part is Buddhism has come back in Tibet in private social space. Tibetans have become so religious. All the major monasteries that were destroyed by the Chinese army has been rebuilt in Tibet. Even though the Chinese government policy is still destruction. That's why Larungar Monastery is being dis was destroyed from 12,000 monks and nuns to 5,000. Yachinkar is destroyed as we speak, but still in private social space, Tibetans have revived Buddhism in Tibet, right? And not just that, China oddly happens to be the largest Buddhist country in the world. 300 to 400 million Chinese are practicing or culturally practicing Buddhism. Now, if you, if you compare Mao Zedong and His Solonis Dalai Lama, Mao Zedong is you know, shaking his head. I destroyed everything Dalai Lama had. Now, not only he has revived in exile, among exiled Tibetans, the Himalayan belt, Buddha, around the world, in Tibet, and also in China. Buddhist in China, right? So that speaks of the resilience of the Tibetan people, the determination of the Tibetan people. When you have only 2% chance of winning, odds are against you. You have only 2%, 98% is destroyed. We take that 2% chance and we come back 100%. That's Tibetan spirit. You know? So hence, as I said, 
Buddhism is 2,600 years old. With that as our foundation, I think we have a better chance than the Communist Party. No? So with that note, hopefully, I think... <laughs> I, I want to thank for inviting me and, uh, uh, you know, thanks for putting up with me. As I told you, now it's uh, 6 a.m. in India, <laughs> so it's time for me to wake up. <laughs> so after waking up, I realized, oh my goodness, what did I say in my you know, <laughs> sleep? So, but anyway, thanks for putting up, and, you know, uh, it's very kind of you to come here on Monday evening. Monday evening is the most precious uh, time in the sense because you have come back after a long weekend, whatever you did on Friday and Saturday, whole thing falls on Monday and Monday is the first day you want to get back home very early. <laughs> and the fact that you have stayed and listened to what we have to say uh, means a lot and I just want to thank Emory University, particularly law school um, uh, and the uh, law and religion program uh, for hosting me especially for giving me business class and hope this <laughs> sends a message to other invitees, <laughs> other, uh, other invitation that, you know, if you upgrade my air ticket, then I do come uh, from time to time. So that'd be loud and clear to the rest of the world, huh? So thank you very much. Thank you.